back to the Novelty Podcast. I am Emily. And I'm Alexandra. And I like to say I read from the perspective of what the writer owes the reader. And I like to read from the perspective of what the reader owes the book. And yeah. as such, we read differently. We do. We bring two different perspectives to literature. But before we dig into our topic for today, I have to ask you, what's in your mug? What I, are we te- drinking? We are doing different things today. We are, we are on different paths. Yeah. Mostly because... You're drinking coffee and I've already had multiple cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> this is my second cup of coffee today. I have been trying to kick coffee out of my life and do all tea, which has been working for the past couple of weeks because um, it triggers my anxiety if I have too much of it. And we're really good at anxiety without any help from caffeine. <laughs> um, uh, but today, I we did not sleep well and we just needed a kick in our pants. And That's totally fine. Yeah. I... The reason I had multiple cups of coffee this morning is I woke up with a headache, and man, is that a good painkiller. Yeah. That's an excellent shot there. Yeah, it is. And I will say, too, that like I have had to adjust my diet because there are certain digestive benefits that I get from coffee as well, and so I'm like, man, well... We gotta fix. Some, we gotta fix that in a different way. Coffee is very useful. Sometimes coffee's there for you. Yeah, and sometimes it's a little dangerous. What kind of tea are you having? I am having the classic chai by Vanden Tea, which is, I love. They have yeah. a couple of different chais, and they're all just amazing. Yeah. That is my favorite. My favorite company for chai. I saw on your Instagram stories that you were like bulk brewing chai. Is this yes. part of your? Yes, this is part of that. I like to. You know, it's like getting down the teapot. That's mm-hmm. like a whole process. It's true. So if I'm doing that, I'm going to make a bunch of tea and just <laughs> save it. <laughs> save it. It's in the fridge. I got several jars going right now, yeah. which is funny, though, because my husband also makes several jars up for iced tea. Yeah. And I have to tell him, like, before you make iced tea, open it up and smell it. If you smell cinnamon, don't use that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one's been taken. Exactly. For so. random tea. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> And just as a quick reminder for the folks, since I brought up your Instagram, our social links are saved yes. below, so you can follow each of us on our relative social medias. Um, and where where can they find you on Instagram if they want to see your tea journeys? I am at roseredstudios.com. Yeah. Um, not .com. That's, <laughs> I do have that website, but that's a different thing. I am Rose Red Studios, and that is red as in R-E-A-D. Right. And lately... This is very exciting. I, I feel like I'm like, I, I need to like pump, 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 pump. pump. Uh, you've been doing like writing updates and like word counts and you've been, you've been working on your, on your writing. I'm excited. I actually have like, I'm in like the 18,000 word mm-hmm. zone. So I'm writing a book that I know is going to be shorter. So like that's actually like pretty good. Yeah. There's sometimes when I, could, I have a manuscript right now that's in about like 30,000 word stage, which seems like a lot. I told my husband that he's like, wow, that's a lot. And I'm like. It's going to be 100,000 words, I, at least. I, <laughs> we're, I'm nowhere. We're barely getting started. <laughs> <laughs> so when it's 18,000, I know it's going to be shorter. I'm like, ooh, actual progress. <laughs> nice. Okay, so topic for today. What are, we ch- what are we chit-chatting about? Today we are talking about the state of mystery, mm-hmm. the mystery novel, which is just one of the most classic mm-hmm. genres ever. Um, Gosh, it dates back to like 18 something, doesn't it? Because with Wilkie Collins, it's considered to be the very first like actual mm-hmm. mystery in terms of like well, how we identify the genre now. Yeah, yeah. Um, which this is a conversation that you and I have about a lot of genres. And in fact, it recently came up with our friend group. We were talking about like, is fantasy stale? Like, what's going on in the fantasy genre? Are we seeing innovation? Because I think one of the things that you and I both appreciate about books is creativity. Yes. Novelty, somebody doing something new, something, somebody doing something interesting within the constraints of the genre. Right. And um, as a result of us talking about fantasy, we also brought up other genres at, this, at the same time. And mystery is one of the ones that we keep coming back to that we're really loving what's happening in the mystery genre right now. It's a very exciting time to yeah. love mystery, for sure. I have, because, you know, a lot of times with genres, like I like the classics, mm-hmm. you know, you just like, I mean, and that was me for a long time with mystery. Um, like I read, obviously we talked about a lot of Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, Niall Marsh. Like that was kind of the golden age is where I was staying. And lately I've been like branching out into mm-hmm. modern mystery. Mm-hmm. Um, my first attempt at that didn't go well. Right. Because we, you know, there was sort of a period of stagnation that happened in the genre. Right. Not too long ago. Yeah. We had what we now identify as like the cozy mystery. 
um, the tea shop mysteries, the yarn club mysteries, yeah. the bookshop mysteries. You inherited your aunt's bakery in a small town and you just broke it off with your fiance that you thought you were going to be spending the rest of your life with and now you have to figure out how to be a, run a bakery and lo and behold murder also happens and you get sucked into solving the murder. Exactly. I cannot tell you how many of these books start with I moved back to home, my hometown and opened a mystery bookshop. I'm just like I, could we at least open a different type of bookshop? Yeah. You know, there was one that like the entire premise was the small town, all the business for genre book stores. Yeah. And it was just like, guys. Yeah. Guys. <laughs> yeah. And so, well, and this is a question that you and I have circled around before, but I think it bears repeating because I think it's an interesting one, which is like, why do we long to incorporate or associate coziness with like stories that are ostensibly about crime, usually murder. Right. I mean, there is, so if, I think we can go back to the golden age of mystery mm -hmm. for this. Now, when people compare these books to Agatha Christie, I'm like, stop. You just stop right there because that mm -hmm. is not true. But the threads that we see and what we identify now as cozy mystery go back to the golden age, which the golden age is a time period that has a lot of upheaval, right? Yeah. Where like, it starts between world mm -hmm. wars and goes through the second world war um so there's a lot of like uncertainty and fear and like obviously it's a much more violent world than a lot of people were previously accustomed to and so the formulaic nature of the traditional mystery is actually like very like calming to people even though there's murder happening mm -hmm. you know you know that everything's going to work out yeah the you know bad people are going to be brought to justice mm -hmm. you know the community is going to be healed yeah. like everything is going to be okay and so it gives you a sense of comfort and like calmness and like resolution you, yeah a resolution that you rarely get in real life it's a resolution you don't get in real life so if you can get it in books like it feels very good and mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's how we came to like identify the word cozy with mystery mm -hmm. because this is supposed to be something that makes me feel good. Yeah. And I think there's something similar that happens with like, and I think we've seen it kind of happen in the true crime, especially like the podcast world where it becomes sort of like two best friends drinking wine and talking about crime and like kiki kiki and there's a little bit of a cutesiness kind of and surrounding the conversation. Um, and I think it functions in a similar way where we live in a world that's uncertain and threatening and full of violence. And I think, um, especially given the female demographic that both tends to read mystery and write mystery and right. also engage in true crime, there is this sort of soothing that we're looking for from these types of, of content. Yeah, because when you live in a violent world, like it's almost like you can't, you can't look away from it and pretend like entirely that there's no violence in it. Mm -hmm. It's more like a way to acknowledge the violence, but mm -hmm. then have that resolution. So right. like you're you're healing that part mm -hmm. of it because I don't feel like the same thing applies to like books that have like everything is wonderful and like it's very sure. soft, cozy, like nothing bad happens. Mm -hmm. Like those don't draw people as much as the books that are like yes, violent happen, violence happens, but we can make it okay. Right, right. So tell me a little bit about like the peak of cozy mystery and like maybe it's diminishment because we're seeing other people come into the space now. So what happened there in the publishing industry? Yeah, so the publishing industry went through like a lot in the 2010s. Um, so about like 2016, 2017, a lot of um, major publishers cut ties with their contracted authors who were doing a lot of these tea shop and bookshop and all of these cozy mysteries. And it was like a bad time for publishers in general, like mm -hmm. Steeple Hill, which was like the standard for romance publishing, actually collapsed and mm -hmm. ended up being bought out by HarperCollins, which when I say bought out, people think that's like, oh, well, they got bought. When those transfers happen, like a ton of authors get axed. Like that's mm -hmm. a, the nature of a publishing company right. going under. Um, so to basically stay up, um, publishing companies like cut a lot of these authors um, and like said like they're not selling anymore, people don't want these books mm -hmm. anymore, you know, this is not a genre that we're interested in investing in and kind of blame the authors for mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, they, they become kind of stale. And the article I was reading on this, like they did like quote some readers in this genre saying like, yeah, like I just feel like like basically I'm just like getting to know the characters a bit more but like the mysteries are all the same and you know the setting is all the same so it's just like feeling very stale mm -hmm. um, and the authors came out and responded to that 
we have been wanting to do more original work. We have been presenting it to the publishers and they've constantly rejected it because mm -hmm. they just want us to write what sells. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it doesn't sell and they access and they blame us. Mm -hmm. When in reality, like the publishing companies are creating this problem. Right. But the article that I was reading kind of had this like tinge of like, oh, are we seeing the end of mystery here? Mm -hmm. Like people finally moving past this genre. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of an old genre from the 30s and the 40s. That's where yeah. it's like inception is like the form that we see now. Mm -hmm. um, and like maybe as a society, we've moved on from mystery. Right. Which is not true at all. That's right. <laughs> as lovers of mystery, we're here to talk about the phoenix rising from the ashes. Some really great stuff that has, yeah. I think, probably come out of mm -hmm. that and like the realization that like people still want mystery. Mm -hmm. This is not about people being like, I don't like mystery. Mm -hmm. This is people about being like, I'd like some originality mm -hmm. in this genre. Yeah. I still want it. Yeah. I still want my like, you know, you know, happy resolution or, you know, we do like the mystery aspect of it. Like, that's why Agatha Christie is still hitting bestseller. But we like that at the end, the, that sense of like, oh, I That's never saw it. that coming. Yeah. You know, we like that. That yeah. gives us a high, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and a lot of these books are rereadable, even if you know who the killer is, like the, you get right into the characters and the humor, but usually they are very humorous. Yeah. You know, like we still love mystery. Mm -hmm. We just want better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that it speaks uh, well of the readers of mystery that there was this, you know, basically a force from the buyer side of the market saying like, no, we want higher quality stuff. We want more originality, you know? And, and of course the authors are more than capable of delivering. So let's maybe get into some titles. Ooh, here uh, we go. Uh, well, okay. First off the tippity one that I'm reading right now. We've talked about her before. We've referenced her many times. Janice Hallett. That is, I have, I just finished her newest one. It was one of those things where like, I was going through it so fast, I had to like stop myself and be like, mm -hmm. I just spent like $28 on this book. I can't read it in one day. I need to savor this, okay? Like yeah. this needs to last. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I, in my, this is like a girl math calculation that I do in my head when I think about like how much book books cost is I compare it to how much movies cost like to go see a movie in mm -hmm. the theater. And I'm like, this is many more hours of enjoyment. This is like six, eight, 12, 14 hours of enjoyment. Yeah. A movie is like an hour and a half. And you're paying like $15 to see an hour and a half. Yeah. I know. So that this is how we get ourselves in trouble. It, it is <laughs> like, it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. And Jan, uh, well, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Janice Hallett. So I'm in the middle of book number two, The Twyford Code. I've read uh, the first one. The appeal. the appeal, yeah, um, and she has now five novels out plus the Christmas one, or is that including? Christmas? I think it's four plus, plus the Christmas. Christmas. It's the Christmas one is just a nice little novella. It's just kind of like a gift book. Still entirely worth it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it, but it's not a full length novel. And one thing that's fun is not only was like the appeal uh, interesting, and I think is kind of interacting with our our love of true crime. We're seeing like that happen a lot. I think in mysteries where there's uh, a mystery where somebody is a podcaster or podcast elements kind of come into, into the nature of it yeah or transcripts or that sort of thing and so for the appeal obviously we have like these emails going back and forth and different types of communication is how the story is revealed to us I think the appeal is a really interesting combination of the traditional mystery aspects and true crime mm -hmm. because in essence you have a very traditional mystery setup you have a small English village you have a community of people that's like drama club that's going mm -hmm. on and then you have like a murder in the midst of that mm -hmm. and that is like the setup for mystery like right. that is that is exactly how we do like traditional English mystery yeah. but then to frame it in like this very interesting format, format. yeah mm -hmm. that's you're right like much more true crime which is much more like you know in right now mm -hmm. I think takes it from a, a into an entirely different realm mm -hmm. because now you're it's much more like you're slowly getting the sense of what's going on rather than just being like, hey, here's your dead body. Here's your six suspects. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the framework that it has to be solved Here's in. the second murder in Act 3, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, you're slowly figuring out what's happening and you're like, it's sort mm -hmm. of like, it's an excellent way of kind of like building mm -hmm. dread because you're like, oh no. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> yeah. I, and I have, you know, on this podcast, given epistolary the epistolary format 
some criticism valid criticism <laughs> because it's not it's a format that's tough to pull off and it's usually not particularly helpful but in this instance this this is the correct way to use it because true. this you, is honestly i feel like the first like truly successful epistolary in like like yes. the actual format as it's supposed and to be here is why because you need to have confounding facts in a mystery and the epistolary novel needs to have like a bunch of ancillary doodads and things that are happening to emulate realism of what it looks like when people are writing letters and emails back and forth it's like there's side comments there's you know other th questions that they have for each other there's lunches that they're referencing that they you know oh, yeah. had with their cousin that are really extraneous details that bog down a traditional novel that's right. like trying to achieve a, like a novel arc. Like a, again, if like Pride and Prejudice had remained an epistolary, then you would have all of these little like side details of arguments that Elizabeth was having with her mom that we don't need to know when we're trying to find out if she's falling <laughs> in love with Darcy. Okay, but with the like crime novel, like you need to have these red herrings, and there, it's a perfect opportunity to kind of have these little details that you're not sure of how important they are right yeah you're like it's throwing like which conversation is important just like just to be clear in case like nobody someone out there doesn't exactly know all of her um novels are written at well appeal is um like emails, emails text messages mm -hmm. bulletins from you know the programs and stuff mm -hmm. like that uh, some of her other books are like audio transcripts from mm -hmm. our, like interviews yeah. you know like so, so like her she doesn't always do the same exact thing but it's all done in unique formats. format this uh, entirely non-traditional narrative mm -hmm. um and i do think like so many times with epistolary novels you have this sense that this character is like writing his stuff down. like yeah. dracula's like this. yeah like i'm running through these catacombs writing my letter <laughs> right. to you or writing my diary <laughs> right. and you're just like where did you <laughs> where do you have this that like in at the height of these moments of like stress you know you're like busting out you're it's very funny and it's the, a, it's very entertaining like yeah, don't get if me you wrong like, I'm imagine, not mad. if you imagine this happening and it happened with um like pamela i've talked about it before she has same things where she's like trapped in this guy's like manor house and then she's like thinks that someone's coming to get her <laughs> you know yeah. you're like not now pamela okay no, this now's is not, not the time <laughs> so this is often i i don't know that i've ever had another epistolary novel be this successful yeah in terms of like the actual terms of what an epistolary novel is like right. to me this is the most successful attempt and at it's that because of like that structure reinforcing what you want and this is like a pet topic of mine i know i bring it up on the podcast all the time but i love the way like when a structure of a novel like supports its purpose and its function right yeah we're not just writing in this format as a gimmick right like it actually works in mm -hmm. the context of what we're attempting to do yeah and the other thing that's really great about janice hallett is like not only was the appeal kind of a unique breakout thing when it happened but she's not gotten stuck there so each no. of her books have been quite original and unique in, in and of themselves right like if you go from the appeal which again has like a very traditional english village narrative into something like the alperton angels which is that one is framed as this true crimes writer it's like she writes books about true crimes and she's struggling to come up with her next topic and so she decides to delve into like a long unsolved ritual murder that mm -hmm. happens in her community um and so it's like all of her investigations into this her conversations with witnesses and stuff like that it is entirely disconnected from like the like kind of coziness feel of the appeal it just mm -hmm. goes in a completely different direction right which i absolutely love because so many times when an author has like a breakout success like the appeal right. the publisher's like book two like appeals to you know like they just mm -hmm. want it to be you know and honestly it's it, more of the same yeah, yeah her publisher has taken some excellent risks with her and it has paid off for them yeah like they are doing great off yeah. of this you know but like that's what taking risks gives you mm -hmm. is like a lot of originality and mm -hmm. books that people love because like like honestly like a book of hers comes out I, I'm pre-ordering it. Yeah, <laughs> it's an auto buy for both of us. Yeah, and it's and they're a lot of fun, and they're and we breeze right through them. Yeah, I have read all five at this point, mm -hmm. um, and I have not been disappointed by mm -hmm. a single one because she's very good at mm -hmm. making each story original into itself. Even when she like comes back to the the format of like 
the latest one that came out, the examiner, mm -hmm. goes back to the format of like emails and text messages and stuff like that because she's got such an entirely different setting. Like it feels very fresh because like it's still a community, but it's in a academic setting. Yeah. And so like you have, a, instead of having a community of people who have lived together for a long time and then this murder disrupts that, you yeah. have a, a set of strangers coming together and yeah. forming a community and then the murder is part of that community. Mm -hmm. So it's like she always finds a way to make this fresh and new. Yeah. And I think, you know, to then again harken back to the golden age of mystery and our favorite, Christy, this is something that Christy did too, is she worked within her format framework. of framework of mystery, which has been, of course, now the sort of like gold standard, if you will. Uh, but she always does something new. The murder happens in a different way. The community is different. Sometimes Miss Marple or Poirot are on vacation. Sometimes it's right. somebody is bringing them in to consult. Sometimes it happens in their neighborhood. Like there's all different kinds of ways that this same format iterates. Right. Sometimes she has a professional detective. Mm -hmm. Sometimes her detective is just like a person who gets caught up in it and mm -hmm. needs to like finish. So it's like a completely average person who has no police background. Right. So like she changes up her narrator a lot of times. She'll do different styles of narration. You know, yeah. sometimes she's first person. Sometimes she's third person. Right. You know, sometimes she has, you know, slices in from like a dual narrator, which mm -hmm. I always love when she has a dual narrator. I'm like, yeah. why? Yeah. Who are we listening to here? Yeah. I feel I feel <laughs> like this is important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it's yeah, I think that when people like describe Christy as like, oh, the, you know, one body, six suspects in the locked room, that's really ignoring how capable she was for a hundred stories, you yeah. know, like literally, yeah. you know, to recreate that narrative mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. So five books in with Janice Hallett. She's doing good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So number two, Richard Osman. Now I haven't read him. You have. So you take the floor on this. Tell us about him. Yeah. So I actually just finished a couple, like probably like a month ago, um, Richard Osman's Thursday Murder Club, which is obviously a reference to Agatha Christie's Tuesday Murder Club. And at first I was kind of like, this feels like it's going to be stale, like because mm -hmm. you know, like you're just straight up taking a title from Agatha Christie. So are you just straight up taking you know everything? Everything. But it kept being ending up on book lists of like, you read this, therefore you'll like this, and it like repeatedly over mm -hmm. and over again. And I'm just like, okay, okay, okay. I'll give it a try. Fine <laughs> algorithm. We'll do like we'll try this. We'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually got like Amazon. Um, ran a sale on it. I sent the link to my mom. I'm like, here, get this is like eight bucks today. Get it for my birthday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I sat down and read it. And this is one of my five star books for the year, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so the premise is in essence, it's a, it is, it does have a traditional mystery premise. It is mm -hmm. a community. Um, in this case, it's a senior citizen, like living community yeah. um, in England. And you have these group of, um, residents at this community all from very diverse backgrounds which i think really makes the storyline interesting because you have like one is a nurse um one was a union leader one was a psychiatrist and then one you don't know what her background is but it's suspicious mm -hmm. um and they've come together and like on thursdays they meet and they try to like unsolve unsolved crimes just for like the fun of it and of course then a murder happens at the community and they decide that like they want to be involved in this mm -hmm. you know this is a very traditional setup mm -hmm. and always and it very easily could have been mm -hmm. um stale like right. like there's easily gone into that however like richard osmond did such an incredible job of writing characters and like mm -hmm. a huge cast of characters yeah. this has so many characters but all of them, he's just so good at creating characters that you fall in love with. Mm -hmm. Even the like bad characters, I'm like, I put this guy on on page more. He is cracking me up. I don't care how awful he is, he's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, like he is so good at creating his characters. Mm -hmm. that you just get extremely wrapped up in in the book. Honestly, I laughed out loud multiple mm -hmm. times, which I love it when a book can actually like hit me hard enough that I'm sitting on the sofa laughing. But in the same time, it's part of what it's doing is examining loss and grief mm. to such a like beautiful way that by the end of the book i was just sitting there being like don't cry don't cry don't be that person don't cry <laughs> no, like no, i'm not crying <laughs> it's like this is a class of book which i i call it like a happy sad book 
And this is like, to me, the best type of book. Books are just straight up sad. I'm like, I don't have time for you because you're just here to emotionally manipulate me. And I don't have time for that. I have time for that. (laughs) Yeah. But I I also do like a a bittersweet, a a touching, sad. Yeah. I feel like like I I was totally fine with the emotional journey that you brought me on. I have no problems. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, the mystery was really good. Yeah. And I feel like he took some twists. um, Because usually in a mystery, Mm -hmm. like part of the setup is like a justification of why the guy who gets murdered gets murdered, right? Right. Like you're like, oh, this guy or this girl, awful person. Like we know that you're going to get killed. And so like that's the start for me. And we're following this character. I'm like, I'm just waiting for you to wait. They got cut. They got killed. Wait. But, you know, (laughs) and so like he did that repeatedly where he starts setting up something that's very traditional Mm -hmm. and then just flips it on its edge. And I was just like, sir? Hats off. I am here for it. I am a fan. I will be reading more books by you. (laughs) Fantastic. Yeah, he did. uh, There was just, and you know, like using so much of the traditional um, setups for Mm -hmm. this mystery did lend itself to like the cozy comfort feel. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you immediately feel like you're home in this mystery, but then it's like a fresh new way to be home. It's like we redecorated the home just a little bit. It still looks nice and comfy and cozy. opened the window, some like fresh air. Exactly. Instead of it smelling like your grandma's house and she has like cat food that's been out for too long. It's very specific. (laughs) (laughs) I might have relatives who have had that habit. My grandfather. Rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> my grandfather's house just smelled like a hardware store. So, <laughs> my, yeah. I had a relative who really loved leaving wet cat food. She re- had very fat cats. And she was a, just the sweetest person. The degree of love that she put on her cats, she also poured on me as her little niece. And then also so many people in her community, just very generous. But as a result, the interior of a home smelled like wet cat food all the time. And that's what we're going to call the tea shop mystery. <laughs> yeah. Wet cat food mysteries. Yeah. You have not opened up the windows and let a fresh breeze in. Exactly. Yeah. So this is what Richard Osman gave us. And haven't you recently read another book of his that's I not just, in that series? I just started it. I have yeah. not gotten through yet. But the setup for it is like already quite entertaining. Yeah. They, I mean, like... What's the title? Because this one's a new release, right? This one's a new release, and it's not. He's released several books in the um, Thursday. Thursday Murder Club you know, series. series. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, because I own the first one, I want to just read it in physical. I need to read some of the books I have purchased already before I purchase yeah. some more. I understand. So I'm trying to be responsible. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Um, but this one came out and it's unconnected, so I'm like, I'll just get this an audio book. Yeah. Um, so this one is set up as... <laughs> a um basically a four hire bodyguard a female mm. four hire bodyguard um and her like father-in-law who's retired a retired police officer joined together to mm-hmm. solve crimes which he definitely likes to work with a senior citizen character that's yeah. kind of his thing mm-hmm. um i do not know how old he is maybe he is in that rage range maybe he's not i don't know but he definitely enjoys a senior citizen character mm-hmm. um so i just started that one it's already very funny a bit unbelievable i'm like i I don't no. think that bodyguards live that interesting of lives. I, <laughs> I think it's actually pretty boring. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but highly entertaining. But already. also, like, you gotta have that's that's also part of like, and I'm gonna talk about that like a little bit with the next person that we're gonna talk about because it's like, well, but also stuff has to happen. It's also it's a book. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is a little bit of that with, uh, with even with Christy when we're going back to some of our favorites where it's like. Miss Marple, why are you always around? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, what's going on? I've been around precisely zero murders in my life. How come you've been around fifteen? This, you go- know, this goes back to like a great thing I heard with um, Murder She Wrote, like mm-hmm. the eighties TV show, which yeah. I have watched every episode. But I saw this thing one time that was like Jessica Fletcher, the most unlucky woman in the world or the world's greatest serial killer. Because, yeah. like, why are you around so many deaths? Right. So there's always a little bit of that unbelievability that yeah. happens in this genre. But it's because you need a murder and you need you need plot to happen. You need characters that are interesting, that, like, yeah. are interesting outside of just the fact that they yeah. happen to be around murders, you know? Yeah. So, yes, I that that's actually a decent, like, that's a balance for me that mm-hmm. all authors have to have, where I will accept... A certain amount of unbelievability like 
it's a book. I understand we're doing fiction. I got it. Yeah. But you have to walk that line for yeah. me. Because there is a line where like you cross over and I'm like, I can't, nah. st- I got to, st- like this is too much. She can't asking- go back into the haunted house a sixth time. I, yeah, at some like point. Like she just got out of the clutches of the evil spirit. Yes, you know? exactly. <laughs> so that is something with writers. That's the line you walk. You can't ask too much. Yeah. Like consider how much you're asking your reader to disbelieve. Mm-hmm. suspend their their beliefs and then calculate that yeah. you know there is a stage where it's just like oh okay and of course people have different tolerances for that so you know it's also i feel like my tolerance is fairly high mm-hmm. i'm fairly willing to just like go where the writer wants me to go mm-hmm. you know so if i'm like okay stop then yeah. that's how you know we've gone too far <laughs> yeah. i think I'm trying to, I think my tolerance very much is dependent on like the quality of your prose. Yeah, I would say so, that too. A, a like fair. if I feel like because you write a good sentence and you can engage me with like a hot, high quality prose, then I feel like I can trust you. Mm-hmm. And that means that I can give you a little bit more leeway. I'm with giving that. you, I'm giving yeah. you some leeway. You can, okay. Yeah. We'll just, we'll go with that. Yeah. But for now. <laughs> no. Yeah. I like it. I like it. So what do you think makes him sort of fresh and you... Un- oh, you already talked about that. Never mind. We'll skip that question. Are we good with Richard Osmond or did you want to say more? I think we were pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next up, Alex Michalides. Which I have read one of his books. You've read three I've now. read his three books that he has out. Yeah. Yeah. I've read The Maidens and you've done... So there is uh, The Silent Patient is his first book, The Maidens is his second, and then The Fury is his book that he came out with this year. So he's a really new author. Yeah, yeah. And and I will say that like there, he has some gaps in his writing, and I think they're, for me, forgivable because I do, especially if The Silent Patient was my least favorite, um, and I think it really does show as like a first time you know, we book. can give we can give authors the credit yeah. of. I mean, this is actually why I think it's fairly important to read an author's uh, like what works. Do we go? works in order mm-hmm. because I have like found an author, read their latest book, thought it was fantastic. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna yeah. go back and start their catalog. All, oh, oh no, you've grown mm-hmm. a lot. <laughs> yeah, where it's like I feel like maybe if I had mm-hmm. read the first book first, I wouldn't have. It mm-hmm. wouldn't have been as glaring to me right. how much they had grown. Which is exactly what my experience was because I read The Maidens because it's dark academia. It's set at a college campus. It has a professor who's a classics professor, which is what I got my degree in. Um, and so I was very attracted to this book. Subject matter. It's the subject matter and the setting. And then I went back and read The Silent Patient, which was a big hit when it came out like a few years prior. And I was like, oh, oh. So this uh, is... Oh, well, oh, oh, oh. This is your of, notice to read The Silent Patient first. Then you won't right. notice as much. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the stories like exist in the same world, all three of them, even this new one. They like... So you'll get little pop-up characters who... Mm, yeah. Who, you know, you don't... They don't... Im- reveal anything about the plot in any of the books so you don't have to read them in order necessarily but you'll know who they are when they pop up, up in the car- yes. yeah yeah in the world so um yeah so alex mcladies well first of all you know he's really categorized as a suspense author more right. so than he is a mystery but all of his books do include a murder mystery yeah. yeah which actually that's something we were talking about is interesting about mystery is that it has like broadened out to mm-hmm. have a lot that falls under that yeah. umbrella or like our adjacent would would you consider a, a suspense necessarily a mystery or is that kind of is it its own genre at this point I think it's technically its own genre, but to me, mm-hmm. like when I categorize a book on my, my my notion is what I have mystery suspense as the same genre because yeah. I feel like mystery suspense, thriller, mm-hmm. police procedural, yeah. you know, like these all come out of the same like yeah. it's the same roots that yeah. these come through, and so to me, and like things like you know um, the maiden and stuff like. At its core, if it's you about who done it. Yeah, it's a murder mystery, even yeah. though it doesn't have any of the traditional mm-hmm. like framework that mm-hmm. mystery has. Ultimately, if you strip everything away, who is the killer? And then yeah. to me, like that's still a mystery, even though we yeah. class it as a suspense. Yeah, and that's the the climax of the story is the reveal and all of that. And of course, you can have suspense. You can have mystery that doesn't involve a murder. Right. Um, there but, are other ways to do mystery. But typically it's going to be a murder mystery, and all of his books do involve a murder mystery. And I just finished The Fury, which I would probably say is his... I think he's getting better and better as a writer. 
Um, and so I do think The Fury is even better written than The Maidens. The Maidens is still my personal favorite just because, again, I particularly like the subject matter. And I also really like the first person point of view narrator. Mm. Um, Marianne, I think is her name. Yeah. if I remember correctly. And I felt like her story of grief and the way that it explored her relationship with her father and her husband and all of that, as she's kind of stumbling her way through figuring out what has happened on this college campus, um, was really effective and compelling. I think he's a, an emotionally rich author who's doing a lot with his character work um, in a deep way that you don't typically see in a lot of mysteries. Right, right, right. Well, in psychology and the understanding of that, it's very important to his writing. Absolutely. So there's like two pet topics that he's kind of always hitting on, which, as you rightly say, 100% he's, he talks about psychology. Actually, I brought him up to my therapist and she was like, he knows psychology. I want to know what his parents did. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, yeah, I love his books. It's like winning points with my therapist, <laughs> and, which is not what you're supposed to care about, but I do a little bit because I... I happen to really like my therapist, but um, anyway, uh, and so she she gave it an endorsement on that front. And then he's also definitely interested in Greece, in Greek mythology, mythology yes. and even modern Greece. Like often, there's a touch of that setting um, somewhere in the book. Well, I mean, like he is Greek, so I'm sure that I, I assume he, I assume he is based on his name, but I actually don't know that. I, I don't think you could have the name Alex yeah. Nicolaides and not be Greek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's sort of like Alexander the Great and Michelades, guys. Yeah. yeah, like, how could you not be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, those are two, two sort of like Re pet... Reoccurring things. Yeah. Which, I mean, that in and of itself calls back to traditional mystery because Agatha Christie was huge into the psychology, like the family yeah. drama, you know, like, I feel like that was a very, like, new thing mm -hmm. at the time Agatha Christie was writing, and so people were really interested in it, yeah. so she worked it into a lot of her books, because yeah. um, it was kind of like a high-level high, high level fascination with people mm -hmm. at that time. Um, so I think there is, like, in its own way, a heritage in that being in Mysteries I Today. I agree. And, the, and especially, I think, you know, I feel like in her, there's, like, a peak period in her books where she's really talking a lot about the profile of people, and do they have the psychology to do mur murder or right. not? Or, um, you know, both Marple and Poirot kind of have this season where they're talking about it a lot and then it kind of trickles off in her later's work. So I feel like in the 1950s and 60s, she was She's talking about very, it more. Yeah, yeah. In her, like, World War II and post-World War II, I think, are her, like, strongest years. Mm -hmm. And it is because she's very into, like, analyzing human beings as human beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a time era, too, where, like, like the idea that someone's like mental health can mm -hmm. cause them to kill mm -hmm. is like kind of new yeah and that's kind of fascinating like the idea mm -hmm. like can this person yeah. escape their you know predilection to kill right you know is a very interesting topic to them yeah and i think in combination with the trauma of war yes know? exactly yeah that is a huge play in that um i think that one of my favorite like interesting um I think she does is in um, and then there were none and the yeah. killer in that who's basically yeah. just like I've always wanted to kill <laughs> yeah. now it's time <laughs> yeah like y'all going die <laughs> yeah I think that was like very much like a new topic of like there are people who have always wanted to kill you yeah know? yeah and you know one thing that like I, Alex Winkleides is definitely exploring this, you know, in the case of Marianne, she herself is a therapist and she has like some people who are not well that she's, that are patients of hers. And so you're like, what are they going to do? You know? And then she's like taking that lens as she kind of moves through this college town and is trying to understand what's going on there. I do think there are a couple things that happen, particularly like in the maidens, the silent patient <laughs> is different. You, that one, you have a dual timeline and you have two different perspectives. And then, you know, they come together in a clash, you know, and you're mm. like, aha, and that's when the reveal happens. <laughs> uh, you, you discover both how the narratives are related to each other and then also the reveal of, of the mystery. Yeah. Um, and then in The Maidens, it's just one chronological narrative. Um, and both of, you have two psychologist characters in those. In The Fury, you have one character who very early on you're like, Oh, you are not well. <laughs> okay, and you're the point of view narrator, and so you get you run into this like unreliable narration, which is always fun to play with. You do love an unreliable narrator. I do. I like an un. I like ambiguity in my stories. Mm -hmm. So if a if a movie or a book ends with like 
oh, if this can be interpreted in multiple ways, I'm like, let's round up a dinner party and have a debat. <laughs> we will talk about this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I would like to know everyone's opinions. Now fight. <laughs> and there are some people who really don't like that. You know, they want to oh, concrete. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, I, I have people clarity. in my life who are just like, that was a bad book. And I'm like, why? And they're like, the ending was just too open. Yeah. And it made it bad. Like, it ruined everything. And I'm like, okay, yeah. just calm down. It's going to be okay. And I'm like, <laughs> life is ambiguous. Let ambiguity reign. <laughs> Which, okay, the Fury yeah. is more of like a traditional setup, right? It is. It is. So we have uh, very much a, a classic closed circle trapped on an island. These are your suspects. Oh, trapped nope. on an island. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and then even before like the murder happens, there's you know, you get an examination of like the characters and their relationships to each other, and there's multiple tensions across multiple. It's it's very much working within classic Christie, and ooh, <laughs> there's other Christie elements that I can't give away. So there's some, so yeah, I, but okay, if you I read love, it, we need to talk about it <laughs> because this, there's, on, the, the, this book does something that Christie's done a couple of times that I think it's like, but okay. See, that's the thing is just like, it's totally okay to harken back to the heritage. I would even yeah. say like, it's a good thing to like harken back to that heritage because we love the heritage. Yeah. We love the Golden Native Mystery. There's a reason we're still reading it. Again, yeah. Agatha Christie hits genre bestsellers to this day. Right. You know, th we do love this stuff and I don't have any problems right. with you taking something from that era mm -hmm. and just spinning off from there. Right. Like this is not a problem for me. Yeah. Um, that actually makes me happy when I'm just like, oh, I see. Yeah. I see you like Christie too. <laughs> yeah. So there's, yeah. We'll we'll talk about it. Okay. Off offline, off podcast after you've read it, um, because it's it's a it, it would be a pretty big uh, a spoiler for a good component of the book. So this is one of those cannot say it. This is one. Of, that's the but thing I when really you talk about mystery, to. you have to be like, yeah, I can't tell you all of the stuff that I liked. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, in actually, I just saw someone give a review of the maidens, and they didn't like it, and they gave some criticisms. One of which fell into the "this is beyond my capacity to suspend my disbelief," which is there is a moment where Marianne, our primary character, goes and ha and is alone in the private residence of one of the people that she thinks might be the killer, and she's sort of she's gotten herself a little bit drunk, mm -hmm. and she puts mm -hmm. herself in a vulnerable position, and they're like, "No woman would do that," and I was like. I'm not going to say you're wrong, but I just don't care. <laughs> I liked it anyway. That one yeah. didn't bother me. But I could see why someone would be like, oh, this is too much for my suspense of disbelief. You know, it's funny. I, that was something that I did, not, not that scene. I did struggle a couple of times with suspension of disbelief with the maidens. Mm -hmm. um, I, there were some times where I'm like, how many people actually have that similarity? Like, yeah. no, so stop. Um, but that actually wasn't a scene I have a problem with Me because neither. Marianne is in a state of such like heightened emotions mm -hmm. and like she's, she's not really valuing her life. No, she's not. And so I didn't really see that as a big, a big deal mm -hmm. to me because I felt like somebody who's, you know, in that state of heightened emotion, who's suffering with a lot of grief and a lot of mm -hmm. guilt surrounding that grief. Part you know, of what like, she's doing is putting herself in a dangerous situation because of her grief right. and because she feels guilty about the way that she's interacted with her her basically adoptive daughter she, yeah she the story starts off with her feeling like oh i haven't spent enough time with her i've been locked in this grief over my husband dying this is starter of the book yeah material. this is nothing this is back of, back of the novel and so that's sort of what kicks her off to be kind of overly involved in this situation right she's already like doing more than the average person would do mm -hmm. but she's doing it in the context of like like this is what I have to give to my adoptive daughter. Like maybe I can't give to yeah. her all of the normal relationship mm -hmm. things that you know I would normally give because of the state of grief I'm in. But like I can support her by like helping with this mystery. Mm -hmm. And to me that like considering her state of mind, because you get a because first person you get a very clear state of like how she is emotionally and yeah. mentally. That I didn't have a problem with that me, scene. Me neither. And I think she's putting herself in, ri in risky situations throughout the book in similar ways. And also you just get this sense of her not thinking clearly and right. being in this sort of like cloud, yeah. of, like you're saying, very much in this overwrought kind of state. Right, exactly. Because there are a number of things where I'm just like, 
that's a bad choice but people make, make bad, bad choices, choices you know yeah. like the idea that just because she's a main character mm -hmm. you know she has to make all the right choices like that wouldn't be a very interesting book right you like you have to get the people into the haunted house <laughs> you know somebody there's For, going to be a reason yeah why so they do had, this so you know and and in this case i thought the motivation was fine for my for my sake but i could see why somebody would be like oh i'm not going to go there with this with this character yeah i mean i just disagree yeah i would say to me that's like somebody expecting the wanting their main character to make too many right choices because they're like mm -hmm. i would make the right choice in this mm -hmm. circumstance so why is this character not making the right, right choice and it's like well i think have you read the rest of the book her character yeah like the, yeah. the the key you were not like i mean okay this is this is off topic, but at the same time, something is triggering Rant me. is about to go. Yeah, like, Rant commits. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. The main character is not you. Mm -hmm. Whatever book you're reading, the main character is not you. So stop asking them to be you and then getting disappointed when they don't act like you. I'm heavily <laughs> nodding over here for our podcast audience. So this is actually uh, something that I think has really risen with the, with the tide of YA and with readers who are about our age who came up in like the Harry Potter Twilight era yeah, and became yeah. readers through YA and you know I think a lot of us have sort of left YA behind because and, and are now reading adult novels which are more complex and which are more sophisticated but the self insert first person POV character which is famously the character of Bella Swan in Twilight right. yeah you know she yeah. has no personality she has very little perspective She's a perfect mark for an abuser. <laughs> no. um, but she's the perfect kind of character, you know, where she's kind of pretty but not too pretty, where you can Associate. imagine yourself in the role yeah. so that Edward can fall in love with Bella slash you as you go through this journey, right? Right. And I think that many people got in the habit of expecting Thanks. novels to uh, indulge them in that experience. Yes, yes. yes. Which is... It's not a bad way to write a book, but it's not the only way to write a book. And I do, and I, and I do think it is indulgent. Yes, and it's I, indulgent for you as the reader to kind of have this expectation that, like, you are going on X Y Z adventure, and it's you, you in, in that it. in that role. And it also doesn't demand of you, you know, uh, perhaps the skills of empathy and consideration of of, of Other character. characters. Yeah, I mean, honestly, for me personally. Again, personally, but for me personally, I prefer like a unique cast of characters that have so much personality in and of themselves that I am in no way connected to them. Because mm -hmm. that's honestly more. I spend all day with myself. I don't want to read a book about myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and I and I like characters to have a strong perspective. Yeah. Um. So you know, in the case, and that's one of the things that I really like about Alex Nicolaitis, especially these last two books. Both of his first person narrators are extremely compelling characters, very different from each other, very different from me very believable in their motivations and psychology and rich inner worlds for and, and I think he's even gotten better you know we just get their memories their childhoods their histories you know and and I am a character driven I prefer character -driven, driven books yeah, yeah so for that's part of the reason why Alex Michelidius works really well for me and then on top of that he's getting better in his prose like he has some really beautiful lines in the fury where you're just like that needs to be on a t-shirt like that's a good line like that's gonna be on instagram posts like quoted in a little square graphic for years to come that's a beautiful ding ding line well done yeah i mean i think what we're like kind of parsing out here is mm -hmm. that one of the things that makes takes a mystery from like mediocre to like excellent is how well the characters are written yeah. because like that's what i adored about um, the Thursday Murder Club and Janice Hallett. Yeah. I mean, especially like in the appeal, and everyone will say this who's a fan of it is there's this one character who is horribly annoying, and gosh darn it, oh, she yeah. is so entertaining and she's so compelling in the story. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. of her being a really annoying character. Yeah, she's really annoying, but you're just like, oh god, what is she gonna do now? Yeah, you know, like and you're in for it. Yeah, one hundred percent. And like, and of course, there's a couple of other characters who like really come to the fore. But like, if you've read the appeal, and I say, oh, that one annoying yeah, character, you know, know exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which okay, this is kind of interesting because I just read the Examiner, mm -hmm. and there's one character in there that at the beginning of the novel, I was kind of like, she's kind of reminding me too much mm -hmm. of that character mm -hmm. from the appeal, and I'm just like, 
are you falling back on that? Mm -hmm. But like within a couple of chapters, I'm like, oh, we're going in an entirely different. This is still. I shouldn't have doubted. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) She's still an annoying character, but it's like it branches off into something entirely different in the way it's handled and in the ultimate conclusion, like very different. And it's just kind of like, just. Just hold on. Mm -hmm. Just hold on for that ride because you're going to take me on the correct direction. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I mean that, yeah. Great characters, I feel like, are what elevate you to a new level in Mm -hmm. mystery. Because then you're like cheering everyone on. It's just, you know, if it's six suspects in a, you know, manor house locked with a dead body, then those six characters matter. Yeah. What they, how they interact with each other and who they are at the fundamental core of them is the question of the novel at that point. Well, and also, if you can get people really wrapped up in your characters, the that can make the reveal of the killer really emotional mm-hmm. because you'll understand, one, you in some cases, you might feel very deeply for the person mm-hmm. who turns out to be the killer. Also, you'll feel very deeply for the characters who are in some way in relationship with that character because you'll understand how devastating it is for them. Right. Like, you've immediately taken this from, like, a mystery to something you're very emotionally connected to. Right. Hence why I was crying by the end of Thursday Murder Club. <laughs> it's true. And, and I would say the same thing is true, again, for like uh, the maidens, when you kind of get to the point of the reveal, and also you see all of her grief and these, in the complex dynamics she has with her husband and how that, you know, manifested in her marriage and her own self-esteem about herself. Right. And then you see, you know, the fruit of that, then you're just like, oh, Oh, (laughs) yeah. You're just like, I'm just going to sit with that for a minute. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And um, so anyway, one thing that I did want to bring up, which is my criticism of the Maidens, which is my criticism of Dark Academia that I've read so far, which is that you have, I feel like they all disappoint me in the sense that I want my Dark Academia to criticize the institution of academics. Yeah. And you have a really, you know, prime example where you have this very charismatic professor who has gotten a bevy of very attractive women, young women students around him. Obsessed with him. Obsessed with him. And he's obviously has undue power and there's an (laughs) inappropriateity happening here. And like... You know, there's no real consequences for that component of the story, which I think is realistic because we see that there are coaches and teachers and people in power in real news stories who have inappropriate relationships with their students. And I think it's a function of academia that this happens. You can have sort of celebrity intellectuals. Yeah. um, And we need to like, and I think that's a great element of what happens in academia, a great thing to criticize. And you have a similar character in, um, what's that book that's super famous for being dark academia? Anna Tart, or... Oh, uh, the secret history. The secret history. You have another charismatic professor with undue power with like this bevy of students around him. And we never get to the point where we're like, we need to criticize this function and how this happens in academia because it's a thing that happens. Yeah. I mean, I was actually interested that the maidens didn't go in some direction because like, okay, we have Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Cambridge stands out in a way for how long it excluded women. Mm -hmm. Like you had like the University of London accepting women by like the mid 1800s. Cambridge is like, it took two world wars before they finally let women in. Right. You know, and then the uh, novel is so female centric because mm-hmm. most of the students. It's here, called The Maidens. Yeah, like it's focusing on female students in this institution mm-hmm. who are being taken advantage of mm-hmm. as part of it. And I was really like, thought it was like kind of a missed opportunity mm-hmm. that they didn't examine like the history of Cambridge and, you know, the gender, gender dynamics. dynamics. Yeah. I thought that was just like, I kept waiting for that because I'm like, this is perfect. You got yeah. this line in up. Uh, wait, what? You're not oh, going to go out there? Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I think that is something, you know, he doesn't just write Dark Academia, obviously. Mm-hmm. He is one of these novelists that each novel has a different setting entirely. Right. Um, but I do think that that, yeah, like my husband read The Secret History recently and it was kind of the same thing of like, what is the reckoning, reckoning for right. this institution that allowed this to happen? Right. And it's like, and it's like a, it's a criticism that I feel a lot when I read Dark Academia. I haven't read everything, but it's sort of like you choose this setting 
because it's a fun place to set something dark and creepy happening. Excellent atmosphere. Yes. And then, but then you have all of like these sort of like salacious details of like the inappropriate things that are happening. And that becomes the focus, both in the secret history and in the maidens, rather than the structural institution of power that allows the corruption to happen. Which could be like an awesome like backstory. Right. That could be so much extra layering in the mm -hmm. book, you know, like. It's not like, okay, you're, if your perspective is like, oh, well, I just wanted my, you know, mystery aspect to be focused on this, mm -hmm. like subplots, guys. Yeah. You can have subplots yeah. that lead and add texture and layer and atmosphere mm -hmm. to your main plot. Like, yeah. enjoy this as a subplot. <laughs> and, and, you know, that you never really tie back to its like sort of thematic natural conclusion is like, you just let the sort of salacious details and then we're right. like oh they did what with who and then like it never gets like <laughs> there's never a point except for like oh my god yeah i mean that is something that is like kind of an easy out is like making things about like just the salaciousness because somehow in 2024 we're still shocked by stuff i yeah. just like I, <laughs> you think that we would be like okay maybe after the pt case we'll no longer be shocked <laughs> only... that might be the the, the final the boss last, yeah of salacious <laughs> details yeah i think that that is kind of an easy out sometimes because you know, part of the mystery, you know, suspense thing is like trying to shock people, mm -hmm. you know, and it isn't easy out to be like, oh, salacious. Wow, mm -hmm. that's shocking. Yeah. You know, and like, I feel like maybe it's time to yeah. do different ways to shock people. I, like, yeah. That, well, and I think like fundamentally it frames it as like, oh, this is an aberration. This is a one time thing. This is like a strange thing that one time happened. But when you're putting in the, again, in the context of dark academia at these academic institutions where we know these sorts of things have happened multiple times time in the news, in real life, then you're not recognizing this sort of like systemic situation. situation. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of at this point isn't shocking. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know why when news stories run, we're just like, well, of course it happened again, but it happens in the book and we're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A person in power abused it? Hell no! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is another note for writers. Yeah. Listen to what we're saying. Right. You, like, write Write a dark academia about these things. We're right. here. We'll buy it. Yeah. We're here for it. We are. Yeah. We're, it's what I want. <laughs> Give it to me. So, yeah. yeah. I, let's see. Did we cover Alex Michelides sufficiently? Yeah. I think uh, we, one setting that we didn't cover is that for the first one, it's in a psych ward, which yes. is fun. Second one is at a school campus. Mm -hmm. Third one on a remote Greek island. Which is an excellent, like, this is another thing we're talking about is changing up the, mm -hmm. you know, huge aspects of it. Because there, like, are mystery writers throughout history who get stuck yeah. in the English village yeah. or, you know, whatever, like, setting they have, mm -hmm. they get very stuck in that. And then it so quickly becomes unbelievable. Oh, I remember. I wanted to complain about something, too. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, like, that. that is a huge... Thing that I think all mystery writers mm -hmm. really, really need to pay attention to, and you know, and publishers too, because publishers are part of the problem. And this is that they like mm -hmm. this sold, so now everything needs to be that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but like getting stuck in a setting, and I feel like Christy was really good at mixing that up and being mm -hmm. like, let's send Poro on a world tour, so mm -hmm. every setting is different, right? Um, and <laughs> this actually came up again in. Um, murder she wrote yeah so many people die in Cabot Cove like that, are there any people left yeah, like and like towards the end like characters are like coming to Cabot Cove and being murdered and they finally had to like address that and just be like the murder rate here is higher than New York <laughs> <laughs> like, like you will very quickly yeah. lose any level of believability so that I feel like is another hallmark mm -hmm. um and then one final complaint Do on the like the cozy mystery subtypes, the like lady who's like a medium who can talk to spirits and then gets roped into the investigation. You can't do that. <laughs> There's no reason why she can't solve the murder mystery on page one based yeah. on the rules of union. Yeah, because like why would the kill or the dead person just be like, hey? That's who did it. I was there when yeah. I died. Yeah, yeah. The only unless the there it, because they're always like a good clock on the back of the head. I didn't, and it's like okay. No, see, you're running into cliches because you're trying to come up with. Re just don't do it. Yeah, the only way I've seen that 
work mm-hmm. was in a story that was more of a dramedy and like it was not a mystery there were no, no mystery elements you just like had the you know character coming back and wanting retribution this person trying to help them mm-hmm. but like they always came and were like hey like this person kills me can you help me right. <laughs> you know right. like it doesn't function good because mystery is about obscuring you yeah know? yeah you have to like not know <laughs> yeah that function yeah. function must function as a mystery right which is like you know it's something that you bring up all the time when you're talking about like it has to work within its genre and then it has to work as a novel right and this is why i'm obsessed with structure is like this is a structural element that's going to you're going to paint yourself into a corner as an author of like you will now have to come up with more ridiculous reasons for why the medium can't know yeah exactly you're making your job very very difficult well, you're just putting too much effort into the wrong things when you're mm-hmm. writing like yeah. this is not wh- what you should be thinking about and mm-hmm. making because it, it honestly just gets silly very mm-hmm. quickly there's no way that you can make this like mm-hmm. it, and i understand cozy mysteries aren't particularly realistic mm-hmm. but again there comes a point where it's just like uh, we've we've left planet earth that's how <laughs> unbelievable we're at <laughs> yeah yeah so that's my final complaint on the cozy mystery side but very excited about so many of these new kind of takes on mystery, these new kind of subgenres, what we're doing with suspense and procedurals, and there's All lots the of fun stuff happening. Also, I feel like, as a real quick aside, I do feel like it's a genre that's opening up a lot to representation mm-hmm. in very mainstream ways. I mean, like, I went to Barnes and Nobles recently, and there was an entire self, shelf of mysteries by Japanese writers, yeah. by Ukrainian writers, by Polish writers. Like, it is a genre where part of bringing fresh new things in is bringing in voices from around the world. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. There's, like, uh, one of the YouTubers that I follow, Books Like Whoa, uh, she's a big mystery reader and she is working on a project where she's reading a bunch of mysteries, classic mysteries from Japanese authors. Oh, and like, they're very, from what I can tell, I haven't read them. I've only seen her content on it. But um, it, it seems like they have like a really unique take Perspective. on stuff. So yeah. it's like, it's on my that. list. I went yeah. through Barnes and Nobles and like wrote down a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So lots of fun stuff happening in the genre. Um, Obviously, like, these are all authors and books that we recommend. So if you guys are looking for more and you haven't read these yet, check them out. Yeah, they are a lot of fun. And we're entering, you know, fall. And for some reason, fall and winter, mysteries just suit that. I'm not sure I can fully understand that, but it's like just the slightest bit of like you know chill in the air and i'm like bring me a mystery i know i want to like I wanna... why we're reading what we're reading right now yeah, exactly because it's still 104 outside but it is technically fall i know i went we i we uh i went to the store bookstore and got uh twyford code and a couple of spoopy books just for this time just so like i can feel it in my books even if i can't feel it in reality i know it's still like upper, upper 80s here but I like know. soon 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 fingers crossed yeah Maybe if we keep reading, it'll cool down. I know. That's, right? how, that's how that works, right? <laughs> we summon the cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for joining us for this episode, and we'll be back next month yeah. with another one. That'll yeah. be our December episode, last it, one of the year. Yeah, we'll do some reading wrap-ups, some new goals, see how, how we worked on our goals this year. Yeah. Let's do this. It'll be great. All right, see ya. Bye, everybody. Bye.